Well, good morning again. Uh, as I said before, uh, I'm Doug Moss, one of the pastors here at St. John, uh, and excited to kick off this new series with you all this morning. Uh, you see, when we talk about Christianity, one of our fundamental core beliefs is that one of the things we tell ourselves, we tell the world, we tell our children, is that we believe that God, that this divine, omnipotent being, is a loving Father. And, and I don't think that's too challenging of a belief. I think most people, if I say that, and you're probably nodding your heads in agreement, you know, wherever you might be in your own relationship with God or your own journey of faith, you know, for me to stand up here and say, God is a loving Father, that, that's probably not too challenging. Uh, for me to say. Uh, and yet, the more I thought about that, especially in light of the series that, that we're talking about this morning, when you say, where is God when he seems absent? And, and when I compare God to the good human fathers that I've seen, I, I don't know that it's necessarily such a clear-cut and obvious thing for us to say. You see, when I think about good fathers, right? When I think about earthly fathers that, that are living out the way they're supposed to be doing this whole dad thing, uh, I, I see things like fathers that give direction and, and advice, you know, guidance. Uh, you know, even today, I, I'm a grown man with my own family, uh, and yet when I've got something that goes wrong in the house, like, I call my dad. It's the first thing I do. Or, or, or when, when someone gives me a, a, an inspection or an appraisal, and I'm calling my dad on the phone right away saying, is this right? And, and my dad, interestingly enough, uh, you know, even 70 plus years old, still is not tired of giving me advice uh, as a father. He, he loves that. He's perfectly happy uh, to pe pick up that phone and answer and give me some suggestions and direction uh, and, and advice. Or, or I think about fathers who, when, when their children are hurting, you know, fathers are the ones that when their kids hurt, they're going to be the ones that help them up, that pick them up. You know, my own daughter was playing in a soccer game yesterday and, and got kicked in the chest really hard. And, uh, and in that moment, right, where she's collapsed on the field, that's when, like, uh, when a father is able to, you know, swoop in and, and pick her up and, and carry her off the field. And, and if I'd been at the soccer game, I totally would have done that. <laughs> I would have been a good dad. Thankfully, uh, Kurt, I think Kurt's here somewhere. I, you know, thankfully, Coach Kurt was there, and, uh, and, and he, he was surrogate dad for me for, for the morning and, and picked her up and, and carried her off. But right, but that's what a dad does. He, he picks up his children. Uh, he, he loves them. Uh, and, and then the third thing I think about with, with fathers is, is we want to actually form our children to be like us, you know, the best version of ourselves. We want them to like the things uh, they like and, uh, and do the things that, that, that we do. And again, like this whole soccer thing, I, I grew up my whole life playing soccer. Uh, it, it's my favorite sport. And, and, and frankly, like my oldest daughter was not that much fun for the first few years of her life. But now she's playing soccer. Uh, and it's so great. And we can go in the backyard and we can kick it around. And, and it's this new new avenue of bonding uh, and connection between us where, where we can actually uh, enjoy this thing uh, together. Uh, and yet, just even in those three categories, as I look at what a, what a good father does, and then I apply them to God, I don't know that we see such clear-cut evidence that God really is this loving father. You know, I, I look at my own life, you know, there are plenty of times where I've wanted direction and guidance from God and not gotten it. I'm sure there are people out here right now struggling. I spoke with a gentleman this morning who, who said that he's actually in, in a place of despair right now, is in the Word every day, is doing his devotions every morning, is, is begging God for an answer, and he's not getting one. Or I think about the people that are crying out, they're hurting, uh, you know, whether it's physical problems or, or, or just life or, or despair in general, and, and they're hurting and they're calling out for a God to help them to pick them up and carry them off the field, and, and he's not there. Or those of us who want more than anything to be the kind of children that God wants us to be, we want to be holy and kind and loving. We want to we wanna be transformed to be like Jesus, and, and yet we're not seeing clear guidance and leading from God on that in, in our own journey to try to be more like him. It, it seems like he's gone. And, and so even though there's, I think, this broad agreement that, that God is this cosmic father, uh, I, I think a lot of times we need to be honest with ourselves and admit that in many ways he seems like an absent one, that he's not truly doing the things that we would like God to do if he really were a father who loved us and was close to us the way a real father should be. 
And so as we wrestle this morning with the question about where is God when he seems absent, I, I think that's the relationship we need to use as our filter is, is what does it look like that we supposedly have this divine dad? We have this God who's all powerful, all loving, who's for us, and yet it seems like he's not near. And so as we get into that this morning, uh, I want to send you uh, to where uh, we're going to be spending our time in Scripture. It's Psalm 13, as we look at the question of where is God when he seems absent. Uh, but I want to call out something real quick, which is we just gave out a bunch of Bibles. So kids, you've got Bibles, and uh, you second graders, your Bible has it in this psalm in your Bible. Uh, you uh, Three-year-olds, it's got a page on um, the Psalms, so you can flip there too. So parents and kids, I'm giving you a heads up. In about five minutes, we're going to need your Bibles, and this is the pages. If you are a kid who didn't get a Bible because you're the wrong age, or if you're just an adult who didn't bring your Bible, we have Bibles in all the pews, and it's on this page, okay? Page 541, if it's on, you're using a pew Bible, all right? So just giving you a heads up. In a few minutes, you're going to want those pages uh, because we're going to be reading Psalm 13. Uh, but while I give you time to find it, because there's a lot of pages in the Bible. I, I want to share with you my own journey and approach to Psalms. Why are we talking about Psalms and using them this morning as we talk about this topic? And so I want to share with you something that my mentor um, shared with me a few years ago. I, I had this mentor, uh, and he was saying to me, you know, Doug, if you want to really grow in your relationship with God and, and really develop spiritually, uh, the number one most important thing that you should do, this was him laying this out, is you should read three Psalms daily, every day. And I said, really? You sure there isn't something a little more interesting I could do? You know, maybe I could, I don't know, stand on a street corner and preach or something? I mean, I, I hate doing that, but I'd frankly rather do that than read a bunch of Psalms every day. You see, I love the Bible and I love God's story, but I, just to confess, I love the gory parts of the Bible and God's story. I like reading about the beheadings and, you know, the fighting giants and assassins killing a king and then sneaking out through the sewer system. Like, I like those stories in the Bible. And yes, every one of those is in the Bible. You should look it up. That's what I like. Psalms, I'm kind of like uh, Monty Python's version of God uh, when it comes to the Psalms. If you've seen the Holy Grail, God comes down and God himself says, ugh, the Psalms, they're so miserable and dreary and boring, and, and God himself is sick of the Psalms. And, and so just to confess this to you, I, I had this mentor who told me, read three Psalms a day every day. I absolutely did not take that advice. That was just too boring for me. I think I tried it for like two days. All right, um, but, but then even more recently than that, uh, last year I, I had someone share with me the words of a theologian, uh, and some of you may have heard of, of a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a, a Lutheran theologian and pastor who actually uh, died in a Holocaust camp uh, for, um, partly for standing up for his Christian faith. Um, and he reflected on the Psalms, and he said this, since God is outside time, and what some of you may know is that uh, Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he quoted the Psalms extensively. He was always referencing the Psalms, saying a line from the Psalms. But what Bonhoeffer was saying is Jesus is outside of time. In fact, he's there since the dawn of creation. Nothing was made that wasn't made through Jesus. And so Jesus wasn't just quoting some words that someone else wrote. They were Jesus' own words that he as God had revealed to David and the other psalmists thousands of years before he came to earth so that when he did come, we would already know some of the language that Jesus himself used when he prayed to God. The psalms are in fact Christ's prayers revealed to us ahead of Christ's incarnation. And when I heard that, I thought, well, that, that's interesting. O okay, that maybe there is a reason. I mean, I, you know, like they say, if it's good enough for Jesus, it should probably be good enough for me. Uh, so if these are Jesus's prayers, maybe I need to look more into this whole Psalm thing. And then from there, I started to notice how much the Psalms have percolated so much of what we as Christians do. In fact, we sang two songs this morning. Uh, first, we sang, praise the name of the Lord our God. And, and that uses language that's taken straight from Psalm 135. That's why we put that up on the screen. Or, or, or then after that, we sang 10,000 Reasons. And uh, that uh, is probably my favorite contemporary worship song. Uh, it's based off of Psalm 103 is where they get the words for that 
song. And, and so these psalms are not just dreary and miserable. In fact, they inform and give us the language that we need for our own worship right now here today in 2017. But then finally and ultimately, as I looked more deeply into the psalms, what I saw was maybe an answer for these most difficult questions when it comes to trying to figure out what God is doing behind the scenes. And when we as human beings wrestle with our own relationship with God, when we feel like he is absent, or when evil wins, or all the other things we're gonna talk about throughout this series, the Psalms give a surprisingly deep and powerful answer to this question that we as human beings are constantly gonna have in our relationship with God. So with that backdrop, that's why we're gonna go to Psalm 13. So hopefully you've had time to find it on any one of these pages. Uh, So if you're a second grader, uh, I hope you've got it and I want you to read with me, if otherwise this Bible, and we're gonna put it on the screen. I'd like you all to just join with me and let's read Psalm 13 together. So here we go. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. So that wasn't too dreary. Wasn't that miserable. And so I want to unpack this psalm and see what it says for those those of us today who are wrestling with this question of where is God when he seems absent. So let's go back to the beginning of the psalm. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? So the first point is this, that the Psalms actually reflect our human situation. When we read these, they're not some weird, foreign, other cultural thing that's some poetry that we don't understand anymore. I mean, this is contemporary, this is relevant. I mean, this is a person saying, how long are you going to ignore me, God? And I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a fairly common complaint for those of us that try to follow God in our lives. And what I think is so powerful about this, that the Psalms reflect our situation, is that the beginning of comfort is discovering that you're not weird. Is knowing that when you feel abandoned, when you feel forsaken by God, you are not the first person to feel that way. 3,000 years ago, someone else felt that way. And not just anyone, David wrote this psalm. David, who God anointed firsthand to be king, who, who, who is said to have a heart like God's, who, who God raised and protected from so many things. David says, how long are you going to forget me, God? When are you going to answer my call? And if David feels that way, how much peace and comfort does that give to us? Uh, I'll share with you this. Uh, I just celebrated Friday night, uh, my 10-year anniversary with my wife, uh, which was really nice. We did a vow renewal uh, ceremony. Uh, we had some people over, and, and, we, and we just celebrated. But I'm telling you that because it was by no means certain that we were ever going to have the opportunity to celebrate a 10-year anniversary with my wife. You know, we've discovered this year that uh, we did a lot of damage to each other in the first two years we were married, and it feels like we've spent the last eight years trying to undo some of that. And, and, and this last year, this 10th this year especially, has been particularly hard. We've had a lot of transition. We, we've had some things, and, and we were really struggling. And, and when we were talking to a marriage counselor about it, and, and the counselor shared with us something that, that was so hopeful and, and powerful and helpful, and it was this. Uh, he looked at us and he said, you know, you guys are actually very normal for, for where you are. See, we've had nonstop kids for a very long time, which means that out of the 10 years that we've been married, like the first nine were basically just surviving. I mean, it was the first nine was, whose turn is it to try to get some sleep tonight? Okay, the other one's on kid duty. Uh, and, you know, nine years of, of kids waking up through the night, diaper changes, and, and, and frankly, we didn't have time to really engage with each other. And what happened la- uh, one year ago, almost to the day, was our last kid got out of diapers and started sleeping through the night. And the first reaction to that for us was, thank God we can get sleep again. 
The second reaction was, now that I have some energy, there's some things you've been doing for the last nine years that have been really bugging me. We hadn't had time to engage or deal with it. You know, all that stuff had been getting swept under the rug because we were just in crisis mode nonstop dealing with kids. And when we finally had a breather, suddenly all that stuff we swept under the rug came up. But to have this counselor say to us, oh, every couple deals with this when they get to this seasonal moment, when they get to this transition. And that was so healing and helpful, just that one thing, because it shifted it from suddenly it was, are we just bad people? Did I marry the wrong person? I mean, it's a real question that every couple, I think, asks themselves, you know, know, did I make the wrong choice nine years ago? Are we doing the wrong things and should we just give this up as a bad fight? But, But to have in that moment someone speak holy words to say, every couple goes through this. You're not weird. You're not worse than anybody else. Your marriage isn't worse than anyone else's. You just are in this season where it's gonna come up more, but you can get through this. And knowing that we were not alone was the first step for us to the point where when we did have our tenure, we were able to celebrate. And that vow renewal was meaningful because it was something that we needed for our lives. And the Psalms do that same thing, that whatever the situation might be, whatever struggle you might have, or however far God might seem, you are not alone. It's not your sin that caused it. It's not because you screwed up or you made bad choices that God is absent. It's just something that every human being since the dawn of time has gone through. We're not alone. The Psalms reflect our situation. The second point is this, verses three and four. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. And what I want you to notice is that the psalm actually guides our supplication, which is a fancy way of just saying the way we entreat God, the way we ask God for things, the way we reach out to him, that's supplication. And it guides our supplication. And specifically, I want you to look at verses three and four and notice this very profound theological truth about these two verses. They're really grouchy. Super grouchy verses. See, he's actually complaining to God. I think as Christians, we struggle with this need to be holy and perfect all the time, uh, and, and we don't want to give voice to our anger. We want to say, oh, no, life's fine. You know, yes, yes, all my cars got wrecked. I lost my job. My dog died. But you know what? God's good. And, and we, we turn on the smiles, and we post on Facebook, and we put on the bumper sticker that just says, oh, no, I'm fine. But that's not what the psalmist did. He didn't speak language of, you know, Lord, you know, in your holiness and patience and in your perfect timing and whenever you see fit, reach out to me in my despair. No, he says, God, my enemies are gloating. I'm going to die. When are you going to answer me? And I think it's so beautiful to note how complainy he is, that God would rather have people who engage with him that press through. He'd rather face our frustration and our concern and our anger, and because at least then we're engaging with him. And and I think that we don't necessarily have to have our act together before we talk to God. I think sometimes when God's absent, we try to solve it ourselves, or we feel like it's something that we need to fix. You know what? Fine, if God's not gonna answer my prayers, then I'm just gonna go take care of my own thing, fix myself up, and then when I get right, I'll get back to God. But that's not the picture that the Psalms paint. It says that even when you're mad, even when you're frustrated, even when God is not answering your call, you continue to reach out. You continue to complain, and you don't let go of that relationship. You reach out. And then finally, we see the Psalm do this, the last two verses. But I myself trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. The psalm actually reveals the solution to this problem. And I want you to think about it. What changed between the first four verses of the psalm that was all complainy and problems and and, and not happy, and then those last two verses? What changed? Nothing external. David didn't have his problem magically fixed. God didn't suddenly say, oh, sorry, I was busy. I was dealing with some other people. Here I am. I'm right next to you. Nothing external changed. God did not show up in supernatural power. David's enemies didn't magically disappear. So what changed? 
And I think it was this, that after spending the first four verses getting it all out, being honest and transparent and raw and vulnerable, that gave then David the peace to step back and reflect on what God had done for him. And in fact, to see that, to be reminded of what God had done. You see, if you know David's life, you know that God rescued him from bears and lions. God rescued him from a king that would throw spears at him to try to kill him, from, from people that would rise up against him and try to assassinate him. David was protected from all these things. And I think in this moment where God is feeling absent, he was able to remember God's salvation. It was past tense. You see, when God feels far, I think it's so easy for us to feel rejected by God. And when you feel rejected, it makes you feel worthless. Like you're not valued or that God has more important or more valuable things to do than to engage with you. But if we can remember that we're not rejected by God, in fact, we've been rescued by God. And he thought it was worth everything to rescue us. That can sustain us in these moments where he feels far. Now, David had some personal examples of rescue. I know I've experienced moments when I look back and I say, that had to be God in my life. And I hope and I'm confident that you yourself have had those moments that if you look back, you say, no, I know God was there for me. But even if in this moment it, you're so far away or it feels like God is so far away that he's not and you're not being able to recall any of those to mind, I want to make sure that I remind you of this, that 2,000 years ago, God rescued you from the worst problem of all, death this thing that no human was ever going to escape, no person was ever going to dodge by holiness or triumph or persevering. Death and sin had its hooks in every human being ever, and God came down, took the torture and the suffering that human beings put upon him, conquered death on our behalf, and rescued each and every one of us from sin, death, and the devil that would have kept us away from him for all time. And wherever you might be in your own life journey and however you might be on a mountaintop or in a valley, but no matter where you are, that fact will not ever change. That historical truth that you have been rescued by God and he thought it was worth everything to do does not go away. And when he is absent, I can't guarantee that he's gonna answer that call. I can't guarantee that he's gonna show up in the time that you might want him to be there. But what I can guarantee is that if you will remember what he has done, then you can trust his intentions for your life. And that while he might seem distant, he's not. Because he didn't rescue you just to abandon you. And when I can't tell what God is doing in the moment, I remember what God has done. And that's what sustains me now and for all time moving forward. Because I know that no matter how absent he might feel, that is just my feeling because there's a truth that's far more powerful and profound than any feeling of absence, than any momentary need. And that's the reminder that he gave everything for me. And on this weekend where we give Bibles to our kids, I commend to you who are parents and grandparents, uncles and aunts, older brothers and older sisters, to make sure that our next generation has this bedrock. Because I don't know what journey your children are gonna go on. I don't know where God's gonna take them and what mountains and valleys they're gonna have to experience. But what I know is this, that the thing that's gonna get them through that might be your humanly parental advice, might be you lifting them up when they need help, might be you helping form and guide them, but what it will for sure be is that they know how much God loved them and rescued them. And so that's on us, that as you've been given these Bibles, share these stories with your children. Make sure that when they do get to that place where they feel absent and far, that they don't have to question whether God loved them enough to rescue them 2,000 years ago. And that they know that no matter how far he might feel, he's always right there with them because that's how much he values them. Amen. And now I know I've probably answered everything perfectly, um, but in case there's some other stuff that, that as we wrestle with where God is when he seems absent, let's, oh, okay, we're gonna, we've already got some. Okay, so where is God when you feel like he didn't answer your prayer? Right, I mean, so this is very specific. This is the, the phone call, right? We've actually been diligent in our devotions. We've been diligent in prayer. We, we've said there is a need, and, uh, and it feels like he didn't, he didn't answer uh, at all. 
And, and, and what I would encourage you in this moment, if you're feeling this way, is, is again to frame it through the fatherly lens. I know that's what helps me. Um, because there are times where I know as a father, I don't answer my kids' prayers. Uh, in fact, last night after church, there's a tree out there that's a great climbing tree. And since I always get locked up in here after church stuff, my kids were out there and they were all climbing the tree, which is awesome. And I go out and I see my five-year-old uh, who's kind of about halfway up. And I'm just like, this is awesome. Like my kid is exploring. And then he panics. Right? And he's like, Dad, you gotta help me. And the panic is in his voice, and, and he's just he's freaking out. He's like, Dad, you gotta help me. And I'm sitting there going, You're three feet up in the air. Even if you fall, you're not gonna hurt anything that bad. But more importantly, I knew he'd gotten up there himself, and I knew he was gonna get down. And, and so, in that moment, just last night, standing out there, I intentionally did not respond to my son's cries for help. I just said, You got this, man. And he said, I don't, Dad, I'm gonna slip, I'm gonna fall. And I'm looking at his hands, and no, he's not. He had a firm grip, he was fine. And it took him about two or three more minutes, but he got down. And so just like that moment, as a father who loves my son, I intentionally did not answer his prayer because I knew that he needed to learn a truth. He, he needed to overcome this moment himself. And, and, and I was able to evaluate and say, this is an okay situation. He's not gonna get too hurt here. Uh, you know, if it had been something where he was 20 feet off the ground or, or if he was slipping, you know, I, I would have been able to get in there. But in that moment, he felt panicked, but I knew the best thing as a father was not to answer his plea um, because that's what he needed the most. And, and so there are, what I would encourage you is this, that when we talk about God as a loving father, what we know is his character that's in that statement. But just like a loving father doesn't always act the way you might want him to in the moment, the way you might think he should, a father might make decisions that are different, what we can trust is, even if it feels like he didn't answer the prayer, we can believe that he heard it. That it didn't just go into a void. My son wasn't out there on a tree yelling for help and I didn't hear him, I heard him. I was right there. And in the same way to trust that maybe it feels like he didn't answer, but I guarantee you he was right there. Why don't I feel the presence of God like I see him in others' lives? Um, I'm gonna say that's an incredible question because that's gonna look like a ringer question because I probably could have texted this question in, but I didn't. So whoever texted this, yes, I feel you. This is my question. Uh, and just to be vulnerable with you guys for a moment and just to share with you, this probably describes my entire faith life. Um, I've never really had a strong emotional presence relationship with God. Um, and a lot of times people have been confused by that because they say, well, you're a pastor. Like, haven't you seen miracles? And haven't you felt like this amazing presence? And, and, and I say, well, no. And, and, and it's weird because then they say, well, then why are you a pastor? Uh, it's like that's the one metric that, that says that God's powerful and real is whether it's emotional or whether you've seen him show up in this amazing, miraculous, powerful way. And, uh, and for me, that, that's not how it is. And so what I would say to you uh, is the same thing that I would say to myself, which is, it's not about feeling. You know, feeling is one measure of a relationship, but it's not the only one. Uh, and, and again, I'll bring up my own dad. My dad is not a touchy-feely guy. Like, like we, didn't, we didn't play a lot together. We didn't do a lot of kind of joyful interacting together. But I always knew my dad loved me. He always said he loved me, that he was never withholding of that. But, but most importantly, my, the way my dad showed love was by taking care of me. Uh, and I saw that in all of his actions, so many choices he made was because he was trying to set me up for a better life than the one he had. Uh, and, and so my dad, I have such a strong relationship with my dad even to this day. Uh, we, we've, we've crawled through a lot of stuff together and, and we've come through it. Uh, and to this day, I have no doubt about his love for me and, and his passion for me. But we were never the Noogies family, you know, like that just wasn't us. Uh, and some people were, and, and that's okay. Uh, but in the same way, God interacts with us in a variety of, of ways. And there are some people, my wife is one of them. There are some amazing coworkers that I have here at St. John that do have this. And, and it is tempting sometimes for me to feel a little jealous. And, you know, well, why don't I have that, that temp, you know, timber of, of, of relationship with God? Uh, but what I remember is, is actually Psalm 13, which is this, that I also have zero doubts about his 
connection to my life. Zero doubts about the way he's rescued me, the way he cares for me. Uh, and similar to my own relationship with my dad, it's a little more intellectual. It's a little more, I know he loves me because he died for me. I know he loves me because I've seen his guidance. Uh, and it's a little less, I know he loves me because I feel this amazing supernatural presence. And so all of those are good things. If you're the kind of person that has that, that's amazing and lean into that and embrace that. But if you're the kind of person who doesn't, just know that all relationships are multifaceted and there's gonna be stronger aspects of it for each and every one of us, uh, but that in and of itself is not an indicator of the strength of God's love and compassion for you. You can see it in his actions. Why does it seem like in tragedies like hurricanes and earthquakes, people who don't necessarily believe in God want to blame or question his existence? Well, so I think there's kind of two parts to this question, right? So, so the first part is, what is going on with hurricanes and earthquakes? Uh, and then the second part is, is then this questioning. So, so let, me, let me deal with the hurricanes and earthquakes part first. Um, I think that's a legitimate question, right? If we say we have a loving father um, who is also all powerful, right? That's the thing that the people that, that question Christianity and question the faith, they, they like to point this out, that God can be all powerful, abil- you know, have the ability to change everything, or he can be all loving, you know, love everyone and want the best for them, but they can't be both in a world that has evil and problems, right? Th- those seem incompatible for the world that we live in. And so I wanna first of all encourage you and say, come back in three weekends, uh, because we've dedicated an entire uh, weekend of the series to this exact question. So just know that this is going to be getting a much fuller answer uh, in just about in, in three weekends. Uh, so come back for that and, and, uh, and, and be excited and look forward to that. I think it's going to be powerful. Um, but, but secondly is to just say that we do have to r- grapple with this. Why does evil happen, whether it's human evil or it's natural evil from nature? Um, you know, why does it happen if there's a God who supposedly loves us like a father? Uh, and what I'll share with you anecdotally is um, I actually have a pastor friend who's d- down in Houston and he's been sharing, we have a, a private Facebook group of a bunch of us and, and he's been sharing with us the amazing things that have been happening in Houston the last month. Uh, that, that this thing that was a tragedy and, and came with all sorts of evils and ills with it was also an opportunity in a city that was driven apart by by racial identity, by economic identity, uh, where, where people were very segregated just in their neighborhoods and, and their places, um, just like much of America is struggling with that today. Um, but in the aftermath of a hurricane, all that stuff breaks down. And he was sharing these amazing stories of church members uh, who basically just, you know, they were in an okay spot, they knew they, they were on high enough ground, but they had their boats out and they were just boating down the streets of Houston, rescuing people. Uh, and, and in that moment, they were able to love and serve people that they never would have met otherwise. Because that just, they wouldn't have crossed that boundary, they wouldn't have gone into that area. But, but at the point where people are hurting, Christians especially, I hope, are the ones that are loving and serving. Uh, and so we've seen in those tragedies how good can happen. But also I wanna say, even if we with our human perspective can't see, that's where we fall back again on the trust in the character of our God. Uh, there might be tragedies that befall you personally or that befall our, our country, and I might not be able to say in the moment, oh, this happened for this reason, or here's God's way he's gonna make this good in the end. But what I can say is that I know that he will. And that when you and I and each all of us are standing there in the throne room with him at the end of time, he's going to be able to look back on that with me and, and say, do, do you see what I was doing there? And I'm gonna look back and I'm gonna say, now I get it. And I'm gonna trust his character. But then to the last one, as far as about, you know, why unbelievers use it to question, I think that's an opportunity for us to speak to a wound in people's hearts. For, for the same reason that, that someone who had an earthly father that they felt had abandoned them, or they never knew their father, or, or they grew up just living existence and, and finding a way to tough it out and survive without having that help that comes from having an actual father who loves you and is present and close. And, and just like that person w- w- would probably cynically question those of us who talk about our good fathers or, or, or if we're telling him, that, oh no, there is someone who loves you and, and that would be just a very raw, something like a hurricane or an earthquake I think would be a very raw way to expose that wound in them it is not to see it as something that we get defensive about. Oh, here they go again. They're, you know, they're questioning God because there's a hearth- earthquake. But to actually see it as an entry point for someone who's hurting 
who, and, and I believe this is true for all people, the way we were created, the way God designed us, we need relationship with others, and we especially need relationship with the one who made us. And so if someone is lacking that relationship, I believe that's going to taint and color and, and hurt so much of their existence in this life, but both just existing and, and in their interactions with others. And, and so if someone does ask that question or they use a tragedy as a, as a reason to question the existence of a God who is close, for us to recognize that not as something that we need to get defensive about, but as a, as a moment where we can actually enter into their lives in love and grace and model for them uh, what we believe God has modeled for us, that, that we can be someone who loves and serves them even in that moment, no matter what God is doing. And, all right, now it's the last question. So thank you for texting those in, uh, and thank you for being vulnerable enough to share those. Uh, even though it's anonymous, I know that that's a, a stretch um, to reach out and share something personal. And I just wanna encourage you throughout this series as we're doing this, text things in. You can actually text during the week and that's fine. Uh, they all just kinda end up in the hopper and then they get you know, filtered out to the TV when service happens. So text anytime, not just during service and we'd love to engage with those questions with you. But as the band comes back out and we move on to the next portion of our worship service, uh, I just wanna remind you about what we saw in the Psalm. That in that pause from verse four to verse five, that pause where David shifted from complaining and venting to remembering God's rescue. That it wasn't because his circumstances changed and it wasn't because God moved or did anything different. But what changed was that David was willing to make an intentional decision to remember how God had rescued him in the past and to trust how that meant God was going to engage with him in the future. And so as we sing this next song, I'd encourage you to use this song uh, as an opportunity for us to make a similar intentional choice. That uh, as you stand and sing this song in a moment, that when you sing it, you would be singing your decision to say to God, I may not know what you're doing. You may feel far, but I trust that you are with me and that you will rescue me. So please stand and join me in singing this song.